We have Donna Robertson today, who, at least in my memory, has had the most distinguished teaching career at Mars Hill College. And so, Donna, I thought uh, perhaps uh, relevant to this long and distinguished career, if you could tell us, did you come from a musical family? Not really. Um, I think my, um, I, I think there was a lot of natural talent in the family, but um, no trained musicians. Um, we didn't even have a piano in my home until I was about eight, and the only reason why we got one was that I had this nasty habit of walking into people's homes and just playing. I mean, I would just try to pick out all sorts of pieces by ear, and there was a lady down the street that I thought got a little tired of this, and she got a new rug, and somebody told her that um, if she didn't want um, moths in her rug, they could be harbored in that old piano of hers. So that is how we got the piano for $25 when I was eight. So that's, so that was the beginning of so that. So then how did your musical training move from there? Well, um, I love the piano. I'm, I, I'm, and I still think in many ways it's still my first love. But um, um, I started, music lessons, and they never had to urge me to practice. They had to stop me from it most of the time. I was uh, very intrigued with, with the keyboard from a very early age, I would say. That's so. wonderful. That's wonderful. So when you uh, went to college, did you specifically choose the college based upon the quality of the music program? Well, not exactly, although we, we, we had an excellent um, music department in the um, State Teachers College town that I grew up in, in uh, Indiana, Pennsylvania. Um, in fact, I, I lived about as far from the um, college, I mean, I mean, from the music department is, uh, and maybe this would be from the stoplight up, up at the corner here, so it wasn't very far. Mm. So, so we really just about lived on campus. Um, and I was fortunate to have good teachers. My, um, the, the teacher I had from the age of 10 was uh, chairman of the piano department at the college. Mm. So that was helpful. And of course, it, it was just less expensive to go to school in my hometown. Uh, I, I would like to have gone away, but, uh, but I think I, I uh, gained a lot too from what I did do. Oh, I'm not sorry. So you have an undergraduate degree from State Teachers College? Yes, yes, in music education, actually. So. And then what did you do? Well, I um, wanted to go on. I, at that point, I wasn't really sure about piano or organ or what, I, and I was very interested in composition. But I didn't really have quite the background to, to get a master's mm -hmm. in it at the time. So I um, opted for a, for a um, Masters in theory, and the and I decided that my principal instrument at that time would be organ. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't start organ until I was actually in high school. Uh, it, it was it was a very odd situation. You wouldn't find anything like this today, probably. But the high school that I went to offered organ lessons because we had what what was similar to chapel services. Um, every week. Now, of course, you can't have that now in a high school, but um, this was a public high school, and um, in order to study organ, uh, you had to pass an exam. Oh, I think you had to play a movement from a Haydn or a Mozart sonata. You, you had to do a Bach two or three part invention. You had on to do the organ? It. No, on the piano. On the piano, so it goes right. <laughs> and, um, and 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 you had to do an etude and a Mendelssohn song without words. I, I, I mean, that was really quite a lot. But, but there were scans of uh, young pianists that lined up for this. I mean, back in those days, the organ was more of a glamour instrument than it appears to be today. And um, hmm. So I got my start, and I guess it was the ninth grade with organ. And um, uh, 
We did have a chapel choir sing at these services, and we had to have an anthem, and the choir would sing an introit and uh, prayer responses and um, benedictions, all those sort of things. And I can remember we learned how to modulate because we had to go from the prelude to the introit so the choir could get their pitch and all that. And we had the doxology and the. Hymns were general, the type that wouldn't offend the Jewish community or, or you know, they weren't uh, the Christ-centered type of hymns. And um, so, the, so we also needed um, organ music for acts between plays when, when the orchestra couldn't do it. So we learned to play a lot of light classical, light popular things too. So uh, that was really how I got my start with the organ. Oh my. So, oh my. So. so then how did you get to Mars Hill? Well, I was just desperate for a job. That was, I mean, <laughs> that, that was the real truth of the matter. Um, I, I was just um, finishing up my master's at Eastman, and I, I, I searched all summer for a job. And, and, and of course it was odd because back then, they, one of the reasons they would give for not hiring you would be that they preferred a man, you know. Well, of course, you wouldn't dare say that now. <laughs> but, the, but that was quite common back in 1958. And, um, but uh, I think Mars Hill was about as desperate as I was because their organ teacher, John Christian, resigned at the last minute to take a job at Baldwin Wallace. Mm -hmm. And they were without anybody, and I was with, I, I would have gone anywhere for a job at that point. In fact, I, I did not want to teach in the public schools, and um, I was even considering taking a job in the bank in Pittsburgh and taking a church job there for a while. But um, fortunately, this worked out. It, it was odd because I, I was hired strictly over the telephone. I didn't have to come for an interview. I didn't have to play an audition. I didn't have to do any of those things. So your, it was your credentials that were, that were speaking for you. So, um, Absolutely. so that was how I got that. Oh my. So what did you do when you got here? I mean, what did they have you teach? Well, I was supposed to teach organ. And uh, of course, Morris Hill was just a two-year school then. and. Uh, I, I didn't meet Dr. Blackwell right off, but uh, Miss Snelson came to the airport to meet me. I can remember, and this was before you know they had uh, the big highway and, ex and expressway and all that sort of thing. It was a long. It, it seemed like a long trip out here, and I stayed in the dorm when I first came, and um, well, well, that was an experience too. And, um, do you want to talk about that for a little bit? That sounds interesting. Well, did a lot of faculty do that? Well, Single they, faculty? Well, they, they, they had a few that stayed in the dorm. It wasn't exactly the, well, Marcia was a different kind of school than it is now. I, I mean, um, everything was controlled or, or there was an effort to control people's behaviors. A lot, lot more. Really? Oh yes. I, I mean, there was no, no drinking, no dancing. Uh, certainly, they tried to do everything to avoid anything sexual. Um, students weren't. Well, the stories about the, uh, you know, about having the it, was it the eight-inch rule or the whatever it was. But back then, it was actually pretty true. Um, Every night at seven o'clock, Miss Caroline Biggers, the dean of women, would ring the bell, and the boys were to vanish. Of course, a lot of them really did not, but they were, but they were supposed to do that. Um, I can remember I, I, I was playing at First Baptist that year also, and um, I, I asked for a key, you know, because I needed to come back after choir practice. No, uh, it, it, there, there wasn't a sense of trust. I mean, everybody was treated like they couldn't quite be trusted. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, no, uh, no smoking, no drinking. Uh, 
Fortunately, I happen to be Protestant, but I'm sure if I were Catholic, I, I would not have gotten the job. Or if, or, if, or if I were a divorcee, because they wouldn't hire people like that. Um, most all of the faculty lived in Mars Hill at that time. I would say a good 95% of them did. And you were expected to go to the Mars Hill Baptist Church, if you did. Uh, and I, th I think you were more highly regarded at the college if you taught a Sunday school class at the Mars Hill Baptist Church. Um, so it was a, it, it was a, it, an atmosphere that I wasn't quite used to. <laughs> and of course, um, the fact that everything was so stifled, the, the students were very interested in anything about their teachers. So if I was even um, talking to a male member at all, anywhere, uh, in a casual conversation, they almost had you in bed with that person. You know, there, there was all this talk, you know. I, I used to sometimes wish that half the things they made up were true because I would really have a great time then, you know. But, um, well, you did have a great time, though, because you met Joe. Oh, here, I did, you? yes. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sure that, that um, we were the talk of all the Sunday school circles, but the very first night I was here, I was taken to a prayer meeting, you know, to a circle meeting. Right. And uh, so it was, it, it, it was uh, and, of course, and of course, you have to keep in mind they had chapel four times a week. And there, there were two different places to hold chapel. There was what we now call the Owen Building, which used to be the Mars Hill Baptist Church, and then there was an auditorium that had burned down that they uh, did plays in, and they had, um, uh, there were a few music studios there too. Where was that located? Um, well, it, it's right across from where the Owen Building is I, I, th I think it was a green area for a long time. I think the new uh, th that new classroom building sits there now, but um, but, but that is where what, th that is where that was. And um, so there was chapel four times a week, and the faculty was expected to present the chapel programs. Now it wasn't bad for for the people who were um, ordained ministers, and about that time, I, I think most of the faculty were. Uh, the, I mean, they, we, we had a lot of uh, ministerial students when I first came. Um, I, I would say church music was certainly the most popular degree in the music department. There, there were about. Um, uh, 35 music majors, I, I think seven or eight people on the music faculty at the time. But, uh, uh, well, let's say you, you, you were talking about uh, chapel. Uh, that was interesting, too, because the boys had to sit on one side and the girls had to sit on the other side. And I can remember um, uh, Mr. Wood, uh, Arthur Wood, more or less took charge in the building that I played in, which was the uh, Owen Theater building. And um, we were expected to play a chord at the end, and the faculty were to march out first. And then the students were supposed to go out row by row. So, so everything was, was done in a very controlled sort of fashion back then. And the faculty was expected to attend chapel if you didn't, you were called to the dean's office. Mm -hmm. And the students were expected to go to Sunday school, too. And if they didn't, they were, there, there, a, a note was sent home to the parents about that. So, um, But none of that was in your job description. No, that right. wasn't in the job description. And fortunately, I was playing over in Asheville the first year. But, uh, well, 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 of course, they, they were, uh, very, there was very strict rules about students then. They, they couldn't have cars on campus. Mm -hmm. they, they couldn't go home weekends. And um, I think they had to be here at least six weeks before they could go home. Mm -hmm. uh, but I guess maybe it cut down on homesickness a lot more right. than the say, right. you know. Than, and everybody was doing it. No, there weren't just the 
the privileged few. That's right. right. So, um, so maybe they, they, they might have gotten a little more studying done. Um, and then, of course, there was a lights off to um, a time when all the lights were expected to go out. And um, uh, they, of course, I, I, I guess there was dean of men and dean of women in most colleges in those days. Right. Do you remember much about Dr. Blackwell? Well, um, Dr. Blackwell and Mrs. Blackwell were very private people. You know, like they didn't have receptions in their home like the, um, like the more recent presidents have. Um, it, uh, Dr. Blackwell was a very strong supporter of the music department because his wife was musical and he had two very gifted children in um, Music. Why? So. Um, Were they at Mars Hill? Yes. Yes. They, they also went to Mars Hill. Uh, they were exceptionally talented. And um, so Dr. Blackwell went to everything that went on in the music department. Oh, wow. um, I can remember the um, earlier recitals that we would have when we first moved to Moore. Um, there was always a reception line, and, and of course the college president and the college dean also stood in line with the student's teacher and the parents also. Why? So there was um, a, a, a lot more support back in those days for um, things like um, theater productions and um, student recitals. and. But of course, there wasn't much else to do either. Uh, they would attempt to have movies on weekends, but of course, th there couldn't be any uh, alcohol, any smoking, any uh, obvious sex or anything like that. If there was even anybody kissing, of course, the students would just go wild. They would cheer and hoot and <laughs> carry on. Um, so what? would be the attraction to stay at a, an institution like Mars Hill? I didn't want to stay beyond the first year. I only stayed because um, uh, a colleague told me that it didn't look too good if you didn't stick with your first job more than two years. Mm -hmm. So I decided to come back. But I, I really wasn't sure at that point what I really wanted. I didn't know that I wanted to continue with Oregon. I, I had thought of going back to graduate school and maybe getting a doctorate in composition or theory mm -hmm. or getting a second master's in piano performance. So, um, but the second year I came back, well, I, I got involved with my future husband only because I thought I needed to learn to, to, to uh, read some German to pass these uh, PhD German tests. So I, I was talking to him one day and he, uh, I, I mentioned this and he said, oh, he'd love to help me because he, because he enjoyed taking German so much. So he would come to my apartment and um, we would read from this little book while one thing led to another. <laughs> and I'm afraid we didn't get too far with the German. But, um, so you married then at yes. the end of your second year? Here? So it was at the beginning of my third, third year, year here. Right. Uh huh. And then you saw this, this long. Did you see yourself staying for a long period of time? Or well, the two well, of you? Or were you going to? Well, actually not. Um, Actually, when I first got married, I thought, well, I'd probably teach till the family came, and then I'd find a nice church job. And then, uh, I, and I definitely wanted time for composition. Mm. And I thought, well, it'd be nice to play some chamber music, too. Well, nothing ever turned out that way. Um, well, of course, the family never came. And then, of course, uh, as far as, um, Church jobs came. I, I uh, never really got one. Uh, and then w w when I had the opportunities to, I, I had so much organ teaching to do because there were something like 24 organ majors that I was teaching in the 60s and 70s, and that was the last thing that I wanted to do on weekends. Um, 
but um, and, and then too, uh, I started getting better and better talent, and that was certainly a big incentive to stay on. Right. Um, that that was about the time we moved into the new fine arts building. It was 1961. Where was Joe in his career at that time? Was he chairman of the art department? Yes, yes, he was the art department uh -huh. because he taught everything. Uh, I mean, he did the art education, he did the painting, he did the art history, the um, sculpture, I mean, just everything. Of uh, your life at Mars Hill College that involved your husband, and we don't have a significant uh, place um, as of yet to talk about some of the things that uh, he meant to Mars Hill College and the legacy that he left. You have your compositions, but he also left an enormous legacy uh, in terms of his own artwork. And the first first thing that comes to mind is the Carter Humphrey House. And uh, do you have a, a little bit <coughs> of um, uh, background that you could share with us in, in the way Joe Chris was creative, what his creative process was um, in, in coming up with things to, to paint. I know that <coughs> in his early years, you said that he was a, um, he did a lot of representation. Oh, yes, yes. In fact, uh, after he died, the things that went the first, you know, he, he uh, wanted his uh, friends and family to have his work. And uh, I had no problem finding people to take the uh, mountain scenes and the things that were very uh, representational. Right. Those things went first. But then, uh, oh, he went through many, many periods, too. But he was always working. I, I mean, he was a real workaholic at everything he did. And uh, uh, he, he would... Uh, paint way into the uh, late hours of the night. I mean, he, you know, he was, uh, uh, after he taught all day, he would paint like some people would practice. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, 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 the, and, and you, um, well, it, as far as his, his, his work goes, uh, he was very eclectic. He, he went through many periods. Um, his early work, of course, was very representational. And then, of course, when he discovered um, uh, expressionism, like a lot of people did, uh, what, what's the word for it? Uh, abstract, abstract expressionism. Uh, of, course, of course, he really did a lot with that. He, he was really responsible for uh, introducing the collage uh, process to a lot of um, Ash, Asheville artists in the late 50s and early 60s because a lot of people there had never even heard of that. So we did a lot of things like that then. And then later on, uh, when I got the organ from my home, he decided that he, that he should have a press. So, uh, so, he, so he got very interested in printing then. And then uh, shortly before his stroke, I, I think he was doing more uh, uh, people, more uh, uh, figurative drawings, you know, right. things that was more figurative. So he sort of made the cycle around that way. And the music <coughs> office has his, his work, uh, the new music office has, in, the, in Moore Auditorium oh, has his uh -huh. work. And, uh, uh, Dr. Reed has uh, his work in his office, so that it's uh, it's very much um, a part of this of this community. And the other the other wonderful thing about Joe Chris was that he brought into the program into the art department uh, some of the finest uh, artists that that we knew about. Uh, Don May was was an active yes. painter, and uh, Steve, of course, Steve Wing was a was a potter. Yes. And uh, so that, that program, we had such, such art experience in Moore Auditorium building, and it really was oh, a yes. fine arts building. It yes, it was. was. Yeah. And then together with the theater, um, 
people really knew Mars Hill College and still do because of the, of the fine arts and the fine performing arts. You know, when, when we moved into the new music build or, or the new fine arts building, that changed um, quite a bit. And I think that's when the um, organ department, or, 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 or at least my job, really expanded and really took off. I would have to tell you that I, I don't, I don't believe anybody came just to take organ from me. I don't think that's true. But, th but, but they were very attracted to the instrument. You know, we, we had that brand new instrument. Mm. And, um, and I think a lot of people came for that. And, and of course, we, we had a very good name as a junior college for, a, you know, for the um, music department. We, we had very high standards. Um, when it was a two-year school, the um, music majors were expected to have music history their sophomore year, music literature, and um, I, I know even in music theory, they were expected to learn um, how you would um, handle other theory methods besides what was taught here. So if they went to a school that had piston or alton or something like that, they could do that, and they were expected to give sophomore recitals in their performance areas. So uh, usually our students did very, very well that, right. you know, that went on from there. Did, did many of them, did you see them staying like when they came as freshmen and sophomores when it was a four year, did, they, did you see that continuation then through the four yes, years? Yes, and that was very gratifying because one of the most frustrating things of being in a two year school is that you get your students to, where the point, to the point where you can almost do something with them and then they up and leave. Right. So where was Dr. Bentley in all of this? It, Dr. Blackwell was gone when it became a four-year institution. How did Dr. Bentley, um, did you find that same amount of, of interaction and support uh, for the program? Well, uh, I don't know so much about the music program, uh, although his wife liked to sing. Uh, but Dr. Blackwell really brought us into the 20th century in a lot of ways. Uh, up until that time, we had no re retirement programs. There wasn't anything like TIAA or CREF. Uh, I think if you retired way back then, you would maybe get something like $100 a month for the rest of your life, and that was it. Mm. And um, th there, was, there was no faculty ranks when I came either. Mm. So. Uh, so he made a lot of those changes, and he did try to improve salaries and things like that. You know, there was an effort to bring us more into the 20th century, and I think, too, then we um, tried to get a, a more diverse student body. Uh, previously, it, it was um, more or less students from Baptist backgrounds. Uh, students from this area, although we had students from Virginia and students from other places too, um, and we had some foreign students, but, but very few students from up north. Hmm. So Dr. Blackwell then, uh, what, was there any uh, hint of getting involved with uh, NASM at that time? I mean, who, who kind of started that whole? Oh, we were in NASM when I first came here. Wow. So, um, in fact, I remember my first year here that uh, Dean Krzyzewski from Converse College came down to examine oh the music department. Oh and he was quite impressed with it. Um, Actually, back then, we even had an orchestra. I mean, I mean, you might not think that would be possible if we had string majors, which is how the music scholarships really got started. Was, that, was Agnes here at that yes, time? Yes, yes. Uh -huh. Agnes Whitman. Yes. Wow. So she taught um, vi um, violin and anything else that would, you know, that would apply to strings, and she also taught voice. And, um, well, I remember that when I came, uh, she would sit in on the voice juries, and she didn't have, she didn't have uh, any students. She had some of the students who were going to be, if they were taking their instrumentalists and they were taking voice for oh. for their certification, 
uh, she would work with those students. But I remember she'd sit in the back of Spanauer and, and have everything to say about what was going on. Oh, I bet she would. And I didn't, yeah. I didn't know her very well. Yeah. I just knew, I just knew, you know, how people uh, talked about her and, yeah, and she about was pretty her colorful. son. Yeah. She was very colorful. <laughs> and Hobart, uh, her son, who was an outstanding French horn. Oh, player, yes. Just outstanding. I, I remember yeah. that. But it was, um, it was really interesting. So, so we can we can move uh, in any direction you really like, John. I mean, um, the the way in which you became an integral part of the of the program had a lot to do with your expertise. Did you have any kind of professional development beyond your master's degree uh, that you that the college helped you uh, engage in? I mean, it was pretty obvious you were going to stay. Yes. Uh, um, did they make a commitment to you? Um, in terms of helping you to get additional education or that you wanted for yourself? Well, actually, I, I got some uh, grants to do further study, I think, in the summers. I, I Oh, during the 60s and 70s, I went to a lot of workshops. Mm -hmm. um, and you were pursuing your composition, the composition part of your... Yes, I was also pursuing yeah. that at the same time. Right. And I did go back to um, Eastman one summer mm -hmm. and I did get a grant for that and of course I uh, did get my um, AEGO you know right. the associate for the American Guild of Organists uh, so I did a number of things and I and I did try to perform as much as I could so when you say the creative artist just has to perform has to do what they do uh, what's your process I mean how do you know which instruments to write for what do you, um, do you have, you sit and think about that for, for a long period of time or you just jump right in? What's your, what's your process as a composer? Well, uh, f first of all, I, I, I think it's easier if you have a specific person or a specific instrument in mind or, or if you have access to certain instruments. I, I, I mean, to write an opera right now would just be a waste of my time because who would, who would perform it, right. and, 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 you know, and, and right. the same thing about writing um, symphonic music, it would be counterproductive at this point because I don't know of anyone who would even, ha you know, ha have the remotest interest in um, doing anything like that. Well, my sister-in-law is a novelist and a fiction writer, and she would t tell you the first thing, you, you always, uh, do what, what you know the best, you know, what's honest for you. And I think that's what you have to do too when you write. I, th I mean, I think it has to be something that's honest for, for who you are at that time. But of course, we all change through the years too. But then once you have, once you know the instrument, then, then where do the, the, the musical ideas, uh, the melodic ideas and harmonic ideas come from? I mean, do you, do you hear them in your mind first, uh, or do you do you work it out, um, experiment with with? Do you work, for instance, at the keyboard when you're composing? Yes, uh, I probably do a lot of it that way. Um, I can remember when I uh, wrote a trombone piece for Dick Kreider. Mm -hmm. the, the, I I had never written anything for trombone solo before, so I tried to think of all the things that the trombone made me think of. And, um, well, of course, there's jazz, there is uh, bells, too. For some reason, you know, you uh, think of bells, you think of the harmonic series. Right. Uh, uh, just various things that came to mind. You think of uh, humor and wit. And so I just wrote a series of uh, uh, character variations that would depict all the things that the trombone made me think of. And of course, the trombone can be very lyrical, so I wrote some very lyrical variations too. So, so you uh, try to think of all those things, but I do work out a lot, it's true, at the keyboard. But, um, or, or sometimes maybe even the quality of, of an instrument, the quality of somebody's voice might suggest something. I remember when we would rehearse uh, over at your house uh, with the with the vocal music, 
that many times you would be singing that those parts, those yeah. melodic, that's why it was so vocal, was because you you could do that in your own in your own voice. You that's had right. The capability mm -hmm. to make those sounds, and so that was that was really that was really for a singer. Yeah. Um, uh, a critical piece because particularly in the 20th century uh, literature uh, the voice was being treated as another instrument and sometimes we didn't get very much to work with in yeah. terms of lyricism yeah and of course most singers yeah would like to stay on a note at least long enough to hear it that's you true <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was really uh, yeah that was really interesting have you do you have an archive of your work I mean, do you uh, you keep your original copies? Uh, yeah, I do. I, yeah, I, I have a huge archive. I, I think I've done way over a hundred compositions. Oh my. Um, so I have. I don't think people really know that. The, that uh, it goes back to that quietness with which you pursued your craft. Uh, you, it, it was a part of your life. It didn't need a lot of fanfare. It was what you wanted to do. Oh and yes, my, my my very first year here, I would get up at 4 a.m. and go down to the music building and compose. I, I just had to do it. I, I I was working on a clarinet quintet that year. I can remember. <laughs> so uh, that's that's wonderful. That's a wonderful uh, thing to pass on to other a, composers yeah, too. I'm sure. Yeah. Well, I know, I know what you meant to so many of us in the program because I remember one instance, uh, I came back in August uh, and went to my mailbox and there was this absolutely beautiful Psalm 23 piece for voice and flute. Oh, yes. And there was our name, Joyce and my name, in the dedicatory oh, yes. uh, heading of the, of the piece. And I, I just, I could hardly stand it. I was speechless. To think that somebody would write a piece of music for me and Joyce, and we couldn't get it learned fast enough. We went. I can remember <laughs> the just, beautiful performance you we did, just, uh, and we did it all over. We did it down at Greensboro. Remember? When yes, we I, yes, I, uh, I UNCG totally remember that. Absolutely, it was just. Uh, it was. You really, you really mm -hmm. cared for the musical uh, integrity of the program and giving us things to do that that were special and got, and right, got us you. special recognition by the by the college, mm -hmm. which was which was just magnificent. Um, so think about some other things maybe that went on that would be interesting to to have as part of this archive for you. I mean, the, the things that impressed you about the college, things that you that you wanted to see preserved. I mean, we don't have an, a real agenda to, to follow. No. It's just pretty much where yeah. you would like the conversation to go. Well, uh, well, of course, I've certainly seen a lot of changes from the, you know, from my very first year I'm up. Really and to um, talk about. I've been through, I guess, four different college presidents. You may as well say, from um, Dr. Blackwell was here, and then That's Dr. Right. Bentley, and then um, oh, Doc, oh, it wasn't. Was Max Lennon? Lennon, that's right. right. And then and then Dr. Lunsford. Lunsford, yes. So, um, and I've seen a lot of uh, changes in students, but I guess that's true everywhere. Right. And I think a lot of it has to do with the society that molded them more than anything else. Right. Right. But, um, but, but of course, my uh, work in Oregon was a big, big change because. Um, it was in the 60s when, um, and I think it was a different age. It, it was a very, um, oh, a more idealistic age. It was a time when there was a lot of people interested in the Peace Corps, and we had a lot of ministerial students. And uh, most of my best students back then in the 60s and 70s were church music majors. Mm -hmm. And of course, church music was a performance degree right. then. Um, so we had a lot of organ majors. I, I can remember having as many as 24 majors and two or three other people helping me teach organ minors. And then, of course, it was in the, um, I guess, the 
late 70s, probably early 80s when everything started to go south. Right. But I don't think it was just true at Mars Hill. I think this was true everywhere. And by that, you mean the demographics changed? Yes, the demographics changed. There were few people studying Oregon anywhere. Right. But I think there were many reasons for that. Uh, but, uh, and I think that was true of keyboard study, too. All of that. You did down. have a significant role to play, though, in terms of a, of a, a program that you, um, I think you instigated, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, with Henshaw Press. Yes, I did start that. That was, a, could you describe a little bit about well, that, um, how that got started? Uh, uh, Joel Stigall was uh, also responsible for that. Um, I think they were going to, uh, they were interested in accepting two of my works, but then Joel thought it would be a good thing if, if we could have a Mars Hill Choral Series. So we, we decided that we would open this up to people anywhere in the United States uh, to, to submit choral works and that uh, the Mars Hill College Choir plus other good choirs in this area, both high school and mm -hmm. college, could learn them, and, and we would um, choose the pieces that were going to be presented. Um, and then we would also have um, a, a, a special commission for, for, an, for a well-known choral composer. So we had uh, Lloyd Fouch and uh, Jean Berger, Alice Parker, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I can't think of who else. I'm sure we, I, it, it just doesn't come to mind. And then we would, uh, we would have these works presented in concert, which we had. And then it was up to um, uh, Don Henshaw and the guest and myself to choose which ones that we thought were the, or Did they were, provide were a stipend to the, to the composer, or was it just the just, privilege of just, having your work published? Just the privilege of having your work wow. published. But that lasted, oh, I think about four or five years, and Henshaw really didn't feel that it was uh, selling the kind of music that they hoped it would, so that was mm -hmm. dropped. Right. But it was a nice thing while it oh, lasted, it and we got some wonderful people here on campus, too. Right. So. I remember Joanne Croom was a part of a Groom. Groom, Excuse right. Me. That was my mistake. Yeah. <laughs> I was, a, was a part of that uh, as, as well. I remember her playing one of those, one of those pieces that had a flute, yeah. a flute part yeah. to it. There is, uh, um, I think you need to, to talk a little bit about your compositional career beyond the college. In other words, the things that have come to you as a result of your being able to, to pursue your composition and and, and how you really developed that in yourself yeah. uh, while you were teaching those, those uh, studio fulls yeah. of, uh, of organists. I yeah. mean, how, did, how did you keep that alive in yourself? Well, I think it's because it's something I've always not only wanted to do, but felt that I had to do. I think those of us who are creative are because we just have to do it, you know. It, 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 it's, um, almost like a calling, and this is something I have been doing since high school. And, um, and I just definitely made up my mind way back then that this was what I really wanted to do. Um, but um, I, I uh, well, let's see, the first year I think I was here, I, I, I had a string quartet that placed in a national competition, and I had, um, I also had a piano piece that won a prize, mm -hmm. and and I uh, kept up. I, I kept writing for whatever I could. At, the, at that time, I was very much into the new music, as you might mm -hmm. call it. Um, I don't know that I'm so into that now, but but uh, back then I probably was. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I had a lot of works um, done on new music festivals right. that were uh, many places throughout the country. Right. 
so I did that for a while. And that you felt the college was really supportive of that? I mean, I think they were, yes. Right. Yes, I think they were supportive Because I can remember when that. I first came, it, I, was, I was very impressed with, mm -hmm. with how alive you were musically. I think that's something that young faculty always look up to people who've been at a place. Are they still alive and are they still out there doing their craft? And that yes. was certainly true of yourself. I mean, that you were really a, a, a pace setter for the, for the rest of the department. And there's oh, no well, question thank about you. that. Yeah. Um, a... we, we, uh, we all benefited from your, from your excitement. And, and it was quiet. There wasn't a, a lot of fanfare about it, but suddenly there would be these these announcements and, and uh, I remember when um, when we did a commission asked you to write a piece for a, a uh, our organist at uh, All Souls Church yes. Yes, at Bill Stokes uh, for his 10th anniversary and uh, and gave me probably one of the most obtuse texts on the planet <laughs> <laughs> and the road to Emmaus yeah. and um, that was um, and the piece, everybody was so excited about it. So, and then you updated that, you know, in your retirement. Yeah. So let's talk about what's happened to you, um, and your, and your being able to continue your musical life into your retirement. Uh, how long were you at the college, Donna? Were you well? You came in '58, um, and um, even after I officially retired, I stayed on to see two people through their performance recital. So it was around 2001. So, so it was over 40 years. It was for really. 40 years, wasn't it? Yes. So it's, um, You're going to go into that archive. There's, oh dear. there's a special archive for over 40. <laughs> over 40, yeah. <laughs> right. Well, but I mean, what are you doing now? And, and well, um, actually, I, I'm uh, really enjoying what I'm doing. I, I, I'm, I, I've done a lot in composition because I have a lot more time to um, zero in on it. I've done a lot of things. Well, I've done about uh, eight small works this year and uh, brought some publications. I just um, finished a two piano, eight hand work that I hope will be done for the um, fall performance of the uh, Asheville Area Piano Forum concert that oh they my, give, oh and um, and I recently had a book of uh, Christmas music for piano that, that will be coming out soon. I've had some um, organ music that I've had published that I've done, and I've oh I did an anthem for the Lawrence Hill Baptist Church. Um, so I've spent quite a bit of time. Uh, in composition, I, I just, uh, well, last year I did um, seven arrangement of, of Bach organ works for, or not necessarily organ, but Bach works for four, four hands, oh one piano. So I did that. And um, I, I play in the Ondewin Piano Trio. Right. And, and we do about three or four concerts a year to various places. And there's a chamber music group. Uh, too, that uh, you've been out to the college on several occasions. That was probably the group. Was it? Right. Oh, I don't remember that it was piano. I thought there piano was a... Piano trio. A, a, a trio, right. Trio, right. right. Yes. So I've been active in that. And then, of course, uh, I, I, I do a lot where I uh, live. Uh, we have Vespers every week, and they need people to play for that. So I... That's at the Givens Estate? Givens Estate. So. So I do that several times a year. You play with Polly Feitzinger? Yes, yes. yes. In fact, we gave a two piano recital when I first That's came right. there. That's right. <laughs> yeah, so she's a marvelous musician as well. But she fun is. to be in the same space. Oh yes. Um, Great Actually, she just lives right down. Well, she just lives right down the hall from me. So it's. Uh, That's fabulous. So that's nice. Well, this has been a, a real treat to touch base with your history here and, mm -hmm. and to um, remember some of the things that tend to get lost in our, in our keeping track of, of people. And uh, so thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure just talking to you. Know, 
we'll wish you good things as you continue to play. <laughs> well, thank you. All right.